Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders of personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. I'm going to start today by quoting from the book our guest author has written. Quote, it can be heartbreaking to notice and feel what is happening around the world, whether it is record-breaking temperatures, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet and glaciers, the bleaching of coral reefs, or the loss of biodiversity. It can also be difficult to take in the overall extent of the losses, whether one is measuring them in terms of human lives, species extinctions, or foregone opportunities. We know that more losses will come and that we have to both cope and adapt to change. This has contributed to a growing sense of despondency and doom reinforced by apocalyptic stories and assertions that it's too late to do anything. Our guest today is Karen O'Brien, no relation, author of the new book, You Matter More Than You Think, Quantum Social Change for a Thriving World. Karen is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Human Geography at the University of Oslo, Norway. She is co-founder of Sea Change, an organization that links research with action for, trans for with transformations to sustainability. Karen was named by Web of Science as one of the world's most influential researchers of the past decade in 2019 and 2020. In 2021, she was co-recipient of the BBVA Foundation's Frontiers of Knowledge Award for Climate Change. Hello, Karen, and welcome to Pathways. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me here today. Well, as the quote from your book made clear, uh, we are flooded these days with a growing sense of despondency and doom reinforced by apocalyptic stories and assertions that it's too late to do anything. How, how do we counter that? How can your book and your work renews a sense of optimism that we can actually do something about climate change? What, what, what do you have to say in general? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it's very clear that we're in the decade that matters and that we really have a very limited time to shift um, things. And so I'm very interested in like social transformations and how, not whether we can transform society at the rate, the scale, the speed and the, and the depth that is called for both by science and by international agreements. But how do we do this? And um, and I think that's where we have to really look at how do we perceive social change and how do we see our own relations, you know, to self, to each other, to nature, to the future. And, you know, so, yeah, my um, premise really in the book is that we are underestimating our collective capacity for social change by um, by basing it on a paradigm that is inherently um, limited. And that paradigm is Newtonian physics or which paradigm are you? Yeah, Newtonian physics, that we are separate, that we are, you know, the kind of an atomistic, reductionistic, deterministic view of the social world that sees us as um, competing almost like separate marbles that come, you know, you know, clunk up against, um, clink against each other and, and not as um, entangled through language, through meaning, through shared values, through love, you know, we're, we're, we're very much um, perceiving ourselves to be separate, this us and other. And that's not helping in terms of the types of changes that we need and at the, um, at the speed that we need to make them. So would you say that this transition from looking at things in this separatistic point of, from this point of view of Newtonian physics, that we're all competitive, survival of the fittest, et cetera, that the transform transforming that to seeing things more collectively and, and relating to our uh, inseparability, to our, to our uh, interdependency, would you consider that to be something of a spiritual revolution? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it really links to many indigenous knowledge systems and wisdom traditions. So it's kind of, and it's not to say that quantum physics, um, you know, like validates those, but it actually gets to that same pathway of that, you know, like mind and matter and meaning are much more related. They're not separate. Consciousness comes into the picture um, and, and which, you know, it's been very much ignored, at least in global change research. What is the role of consciousness, our awareness of our interconnections? So, so I do think that it goes beyond just a very material sense of understanding of how we're impacting the world, but it looks, you know, beyond that into the spiritual, into the, um, you know, yeah, non-local, non-verbal um, 
yeah can, like the the oneness that um that earth system science is really telling us is the case and and, and that's you know it's it's really important that we get that when you talk about system science are you talking about uh, uh quantum physics or I'm talking about the field that is um, like earth system science is really, you know, the, the the people working on global change research that are looking at like the atmosphere, the biosphere, hydrosphere, like how, do, how the entire earth system is, um, you know, works and why it really matters that we put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, why, you know, polluting the oceans or acidifying oceans matters and, you know, like basically, you know, what we as humans are doing to, um, you know, to the planet at a global scale. And so, you know, and so I'm interested in it is, you know, the social dimensions when one part of that system becomes self-aware that we are transforming the system. Um, scientists are calling this, a, you're proposing a geological epoch called the Anthropocene, you know, where humans are actually having a, a geological impact on the earth. And, um, and I'm really interested to see like, how do, we actually take that knowledge that we can transform large systems and then deliberately transform towards an equitable and thriving world. You know, it's really hard to believe these days that any normal individual could make much of a difference um, in spite of the theoretical or, I mean, the very abstract uh, science of of quantum interrelationship. You know, why don't we talk about that for a second? What are the premises of uh, that quantum physics has uh, has evolved of, of compared to Newtonian physics, the fact that um, that we're not that that the way that what we do and and our consciousness actually uh, impacts things. Can you just speak? I, I don't want to get deeply into physics, mm -hmm. but, but I, can you just speak to mm -hmm. what is that? What did we learn from quantum physics that you're applying now to social? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think quantum physics and the discoveries go back over a hundred years, really show us that reality is not what it seems at the subatomic level. And that, you know, concepts such as uncertainty, complementarity, superpositions that, you know, the, there are many different interpretations of quantum physics. And one of them is that, you know, like reality doesn't um, emerge until a measurement is made. And that's the Copenhagen school of um, Niels Bohr's um, interpretation, but there are many others like the multiple um, worlds interpretation that there, you know, everything happens in some universe and um, quantum Bayesianism that our beliefs are actually implementing. So what's interesting to me is that we really don't understand reality at that subatomic level. And yet we assume that the principles of classical Newtonian physics apply um, at, the, at the social level. And, and I think that when we start to look at, you know, entanglement, not just among particle, you know, non-local correlations between particles, but we can look at that, you know, as through language, as through meaning, it's, um, we start to widen the lens and also deepen the lens through which we, you know, this, the solutions become um, more, you know, like us. And it really gets into um, interpretations like participatory realism and agential realism that, that we are part of the world that we are creating right now. And to me, that is, you know, that gives us a lot more um, power to actually influence these systems. So, you know, mattering in the moment, not just, you know, like in this trivial sense of being significant, but literally collapsing a wave of potential into an actual reality in every moment. And so, you know, sometimes we just think like, oh, I'm too small to make a difference. I can't do anything game over. And we fall into that um, despair and despondency when actually we all have spheres of influence. We are always engaged in conversations and so it is like you know how do you connect at that deeper level and um you know move beyond this kind of top down bottom up view of change or local global um, or just you know individual collective and see that the individual is the collective we are the systems and that that gives us a lot of power to actually make decisions that are you know that are based on the the whole um, and more like what I refer to as fractals or self-similar patterns that reproduce at all scales rather than this fragmented approach that is leading to a very polarized world right now and fragmentation and um, you know really the kind of that that dystopian view of the world that many of us are just looking out and seeing today. Well the polarization is we really can't deny that you know sort of like 
I, I would argue, and I'm, I want to be wrong, <laughs> but I would argue that, you know, okay, I could appreciate a more uh, collective global point of view that's based on um, quantum, a concept of quantum social change that the more conscious I am of my interconnection mm. and, you know, so what, you know, that I matter because I'm, a, you know, connected mm. to the whole, but then I look at, you know, half the population is just stubbornly refusing to consider their um, their responsibility, their interconnection to the whole. They just care about things like the price of a gallon of gas or, you know, the, it just seems so intractable to get people to change their minds. Uh, and that seems to be what needs to happen. Now, I know that's a polarized political sort of orientation, but to me, it seems obvious what the solution is to climate change. We have to stop burning fossil fuels. And when half the population is in denial about that, what what do you do? How, do, how does that, how does having higher consciousness help? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. It might help me from a spiritual point of view, but how does it help change happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think, that, you know, the example of, you know, that polarization and that some people really, you know, do not, they don't believe in climate change, they don't believe they matter, they don't believe that, that, um, that the future matters um, for that. Um, you know, we have some, and it, it shows you the power of belief systems and also that, that tendency that, you know, like we always divide like us and other, and how do you, how do you connect to people who don't share your worldviews? How yeah, do you connect, you know, how do you have a different conversation based on what matters to them? And, and, and often it's like the same thing of, you know, being acknowledged, feeling connected, um, et cetera. But, um, but I think those examples really show the power of like how we've, you know, we've been led to believe this paradigm of separatism, you know, that we're separate, that um, nature doesn't matter, that the future doesn't matter, um, et cetera. And people are very much entrenched in a mindset. And, and so, you know, how do you shift out of that? And I think it's the, um, you know, it really is like that quality of agency, how we show up in those conversations that is going to um, um, shift people um, but we don't really have that much time to wait till people change their worldviews and people aren't going to do that. So right. it really becomes then of like, how do, you know, how do people change systems? And that is, you know, that comes down to the strategies for shifting cultures and systems where we don't need 51% or 99% of the people to change, but we really do need, you know, that, um, you know, it, it comes down to politics and it comes down to people actually recognizing that it's not just their vote that matters, but it's, you know, their whole engagement with these systems and not just greenhouse gases from fossil fuels, but what we eat, what we consume, how we relate. And I always think of, um, you know, that we've, we kind of box off climate change and um, biodiversity loss if, as if they're environmental problems, but they really are relationship problems. You know, they're really about how we relate to ourselves and each other and the future. And, and to me, that's, you know, it brings in the social dimensions, it brings in the human dimensions, and, um, and it becomes much more complex, but also, you know, like, much, much simpler, too. It's like, well, how do we actually, um, you know, get to those, you know, the depth of those types of conversations so that people, um, regardless of where they are, are doing things, maybe not for the same reason, but renewable energy makes sense from so many, um, you know, there, there's, there's so many reasons to do the types of um, solutions that are needed right now. Right. It's not just climate change, it's, it's biodiversity loss, it's pollution, it's mental health, there's, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the full, um, a full spectrum of um, issues. Right. If we, solve what, if we solve climate change as a relationship issue, we solve many other problems as well. Right. And as you point out in the book, and it's about changing our beliefs and our point of view. And if we are to go beyond just our own individual uh, mindset, it's about helping other people change their beliefs. You know, I wrote a book called Intuitive Intelligence, and one of the chapters is called Belief Engineering. And I'm talking about how important beliefs are, but they're not sacred. And one of the things we're up against is people think they are sacred. People are willing to go to war to defend what they were taught to believe mm -hmm. when they were five years old, you know, and it's a, you know, religion is a great example of that. Um, so people don't even, aren't really, I mean, it seems like such a monumental task to get people to consider that their beliefs are actually choices that they should be making for themselves and that 
their beliefs matter. And it's not just simply a matter of pledging allegiance. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I've have, I have issues with faith-based religions because of that, because I think, mm -hmm. you know, this concept that it doesn't matter what you do or how you interrelate, it only matters what you believe. And then Jesus is going to save you. I can't mm -hmm. buy that. You know, you know, personally, mm -hmm. that's a big problem for me, but that's the way millions and billions of people uh, think. And I don't know how we change that because it's such an article of faith. Um, Cause I agree with you. I think that mm -hmm. beliefs shape our reality and uh, are including our shared social reality. Um, but I don't know how we can get people to be mm -hmm. willing to consider that they've got some, some um, obsolete beliefs. And yeah. And that's a point I make in the book is, you know, how do we look at our beliefs rather than through our beliefs? And, you know, I think that goes for all of us as, you know, as researchers and things, because we tend to just say, this is the way it is. And, um, and that um, those beliefs can be very powerful, even, and especially if we're thinking right now that, you know, like, oh, it's too late to do anything. I don't believe that, you know, society will change. I believe, you know, those are also powerful beliefs that get in the way of, you know, just to say that these hierarchies, the, the you know, the way, you know, interests will never change, power relationships will ever change. Those are, will never change. Those are also, um, you know, very powerful beliefs. So I think for all of us to, to challenge our beliefs and, and open inquiries, because there, there's a real danger that when we, try to change other people's beliefs and worldviews and values and things, you know, you're turning people into objects to be changed. And all you do is get pushback then, like, you know, who are you to tell me? And that's been throughout history. It's been, you know, the role of religions and indoctrination and, and things. And so how do you actually, you know, open up that space where every person can actually, you know, like, um, be the subject of change in their own lives and, and, but not just, you know, like, as we see in many parts of the world of just, you know, like populist, um, you know, you see people really wanting to matter, but mattering on, you know, with, with the responsibility for the whole in, um, you know, in the, um, you know, the values like um, equity and dignity and compassion and, and things that apply to everyone and our, all species. So, so it's really like, it is the quality of agency, the quality of relationships that are, are going to determine our future. And, um, and that's where, you know, I also emphasizing in the book, the power of metaphors, the power of stories um, to tell, to tell that different, you know, put ourselves in as the protagonists rather than as just the end, you know, the, the um, villains in climate change. And I think that's where, you know, when the, whether it's an individual like Greta Thunberg, or, um, you know, there's so many people on the planet right now who are working to make a difference. And um, it's, you know, a little bit off the radar from the news that we're seeing, but it is like you know, little fractals here and there and there. And, um, and I think that um, right now, I would say the bar is so low that it really doesn't take that much to actually make a positive difference in the world today. And so whether, you know, by choices of what we eat, what we buy, how we travel, how we speak to um, people, it's, um, you know, it really does come down to mattering in the moment. You know, you say it's, it's important to back up intuitive thinking, intuitive beliefs with critical thinking. And so it sounds to me like a, a part of the solution is education. And that's what you're doing. And that's what you're mm -hmm. involved with. What do you, what is uh, your work at the University of, of Oslo? Mm -hmm. um, I teach, I'm a human geographer and I teach courses on like environment and society and transformations to sustainability. So I really try to help people see the issues from different angles and perspectives and to, um, you know, take a more integrative approach to this and really like not just give the, you know, this is the problem, these are the solutions and things, but open up that space to see how does your uncle who doesn't, you know, believe in climate change see the issue? How do we, you know, how do we actually transform society in a way that is um, equitable and just, and not just through, you know, like geoengineering or authoritarian uh, rule and things? And I, I think there is, um, it really, you know, to open up people's views to, you know, the, the power of our beliefs, the role of values, how our own worldviews limit or, you know, that we all have like filters and blind spots on the way that we see the world and to open that up. And, and to me, it's very important right now because many students are very um, emotionally affected by climate change. So bringing in the, you know, like the, the head, heart, hands approach and recognizing that we're more than just, you know, this is not just a cognitive issue. It's an emotional issue. It's a, you know, that like 
to actually activate that sense of agency, um, individual agency, collective agency, and political agency really is, you know, I think the uh, a goal for education and not just to get people to, you know, reduce people to their carbon footprints and say that, you know, you have to, you know, like, you know, sort your trash, do this or that, when we're really talking about systems change and we're talking about, you know, how do we deliberately and consciously transform systems? I thought it was very interesting. You, you just brought up emotional, the aspect of, of things, how your book uh, ties in our childhood experiences with climate change and with um, our attitudes. Uh, can you explain the effect of adverse childhood experiences uh, in this context? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, the issue of trauma has been um, discussed a lot late, lately, not just individual trauma, but collective trauma. And, um, you know, talking with people who work in public health, like Christina Bethel, who wrote the foreword to the book, you know, her, her line is that, you know, like you matter also from that public health that we're all like seeking from, you know, from the our earliest years to matter and to have that connection and, and um, like, really be acknowledged for who we are. And if we don't get that in a healthy way, we, we lash out and try to matter in very unhealthy ways. And I think that, that you know, there's a lot of, um, if we want, a, you know, healthy responses to complex global challenges, it will take a lot of healing of trauma. It will take a lot of, you know, like really looking at, you know, um, you know, colonization and, you know, there's been a lot of wrongs in the world and a lot of people, there's, like, there, there are a lot of grievances and injustices that have been carried out. And so how do we trend, you know, how do we actually address those and, and work together collectively? It's something that, you know, we've, we could talk about for hundreds of years, but really, you know, we have about 10 years, according to the science, before we start to see the tipping points. And that brings me back to that first quote that you mentioned, where, you know, we are losing things, and we will lose things, and, you know, the sea, sea level will rise. But there's such a big difference between, you know, one and a half degrees Celsius global warming and two degrees or three degrees or four degrees, or, you know, half a meter of sea level rise versus, you know, one meter, two meters, four meters, and things. So what we do right here, right now really does matter. And at the end of the day, we just know that we can do better. Right. You know, you say in the book, I'm going to quote you here, fortunately, research shows that an influx of intentionally created positive childhood experiences and relational healing methods can interrupt the traumatic impact of uh, adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. and their far-reaching impacts on our health, society, and in turn, our environment and climate. So this is a kind of, your book has really got an interesting matrix mm -hmm. of, of uh, aspects of, of how we can heal and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and, and solve this, this collective problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that goes back to Christina Bethel's work on positive childhood experiences um, in the foreword to the book that, you know, we, we focus on the negative, but like we can make such a difference by, you know, it often is just like one experience can make a world of difference to someone in, in how they feel and whether they see, feel like they've been seen and that they matter. And, um, and we, you know, unleashing that potential of every individual, we start to see that, you know, people are the most powerful solution to climate change. And so how do you, and it might happen like one person at a time, one group at a time and things, but I think that that, um, to unleash that potential, we really have to shift our perspective on, you know, social change. So what makes you feel hopeful these days? Because that, that's a problem I have is, you know, it's, it just seems so hopeless to think that in 10 years, we're going to change enough people's minds to actually mm -hmm. change the way that we buy cars, the way that we do uh, all kinds of things. Yeah, we may not change people's minds, but we can change systems and, you know, and the rules and the regulations and the institutions. And what gives me hope is that there's so many young people who really, they're, um, you know, they're connecting the dots in a completely different way. It matters to them what we do right now. And they are so engaged and so, you know, on it. And there's people of all ages that really, you know, recognize that. And I, I feel very fortunate because I work in a community of um, you know, researchers and practitioners that really care. And there's there's so many people who really do care, and that gives me a lot of hope too. That you know, it's the that how do we get out of our own way to um, to really you know to accelerate these transformations without going into okay, people you have to change people's beliefs, but how do you unleash 
that um, you know those that and you know you said it goes to education, but it's it can't just be informal education. It's got to be like an open inquiry and discussion and um, story. Like I, I think it's like the whole conversation has to change. The way we talk about change has to change. Right. How will we know quantum social change when we see it? I think it's more something that we might feel because it's something that, you know, and in some ways it's like more of a metaphor of that, you know, the quantum leap that is, um, you know, how do we, when we suddenly start to, and I've done that in workshops of, you know, imagine if you wake up and we've experienced this quantum leap to sustainability, what would it feel like, smell like, you know, sound like, taste like, and, and to really like visualize that future and bring it to right here and right now. And you see that there's a lot of elements that are very accessible right here and right now. And it comes down to the relationships we have, the connections that we have, and really feeling that, you know, that sense of oneness that um, I think it's inherent in all of us, but it's been so covered up by the way we've been raised and the media, the way that we've been, um, you know, almost like brainwashed to believe that we don't matter, that we're separate, that other people are expendable, disposable, that species are, you know, like that we we really have, um, you know, been been I think like sold the wrong story, and it, many. Um, many cultures are are practicing and living like radical relationality and um yeah so i, I believe that we there is really a lot of hope but it really depends on each and every one of us stepping up and taking that responsibility or that response ability you know that we have that ability to respond well i want to thank you for your work and for your book and for um the consciousness raising uh stories and ideas that you are bringing forth uh it's beautiful. And I want to be sure to tell our listeners about your website, which is you matter more than you think.com. All one word, you matter more than you think.com. Um, and what can people find there briefly? Yeah. Um, well, we, um, we, we just talk, you know, have like a little bit about the book. And it was a collaboration with a Norwegian artist, Tone Bjordam. So it's beautifully illustrated. And that really was the heart of it, because some of these concepts are very abstract, but her, her artwork really like um, brings it to life. And I think so we, we put some of the artwork on and some of the, you know, little like feedback on, on the book on the website. Beautiful. You matter more than you think dot com. Well, thank you for being with us today, Karen. I wish we had more time. There's so much to talk about, but uh, I, I do want to thank you for being on the show and for doing what you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to, to Pathways Radio. And for those who may have turned into Pathways late, uh, this is your host, Paul O'Brien, author of Intuitive Intelligence, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. And don't worry, you can play and or share this interview whenever you want via the internet or free podcast servers. And I'll tell you how in a minute. Today, we've been visiting with Karen O'Brien. I don't think we're closely related, although I am wearing my O'Brien family mm -hmm. dress shirt in honor of the occasion. Mm -hmm. um, and Karen is the author of You Matter More Than You Think, Quantum Social Change for Thriving Worlds. And I wanna say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into Pathways, which is broadcast and streamed on the internet at www.kboo.fm every other Sunday morning at 8.30 USA Pacific time. And even better, podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, are available for free at divination.com, spelled D-I-V-I nation.com, as well as via iTunes, my YouTube channel, and other free podcast servers. This is Paul O'Brien reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. And thanks again to Karen O'Brien and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways Conversation. <laughs>